Welcome to the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke, a show about ancient coins from the viewpoint of a seasoned professional with nearly 30 years experience. Here's Aaron Burke and Mike Nottleman on the Ancient Coin Podcast. And the sound of the gong means it is once again time. Yeah, you hit it, bud. Uh, it is once again time for the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke. I'm Mike Nottleman, your host. I'm Aaron Burke. Yes, he is the aforementioned Aaron Burke. And uh, just if this is your first time, I want you to know that, you know, it's okay. You can just kind of jump right in. There's no particular episode that you need to start from, but just kind of a quick background. Uh, Aaron and his dad own a pretty well-known coin shop where I work as a U.S. numismatist, but I've always kind of wanted to learn more about ancient coins. Aaron said he'd teach me about ancient coins, and so we kind of decided to make this podcast so that you can learn with me. And, you know, they're available on our website at hjbltd.com so that you can access them at your leisure. On today's episode, we have yet another pearl of wisdom uh, for our necklace, and uh, hopefully that's going to make you a smarter coin buyer. We'll look at someone who wasn't quite so smart as we examine another doofus purchase, but before all that... Uh, Aaron is going to tell us about some of the highlights of what's coming up at auction. And uh, Aaron, tell us what's going on. Yeah, well, it's been a slow summer, uh, but we're heading into the auction season. Yay! So that's pretty exciting. Coins are back. September, October is going to be uh, busy, 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 busy. We just finished with the Heritage and Stacks auctions. Quite strong. Um, but uh, we're going into the real auction season starting uh probably the end of September. But two auctions I kind of wanted to bring up. One you probably never heard of and one you guys have all heard of probably. So the first one is the Paul Francis Jacquier Numismatica Antique Auction 50. It's uh, going to be September 16th and 17th. And, um, uh, you know, they're in Germany. They've been around for a long time. They're IEPN members, which is an international organization that we at Harlem Burke are also members of as well. Uh, there are, uh, you know, some decent coins in here and, uh, and some not so decent coins. But uh, I wanted to highlight two that I thought were, you know, interesting, at least, you know, from my perspective. And the first one, if you might want to bring up lot 49, and that is the Brutium Croton. Uh, Brutium and Croton, that is in the southern part of Italy. Uh, where this is minted during the Greek period. This is a nomos or, or didram. Sometimes you get these different denomination names based on modern and old views. And so uh, that's why you'll see didram slash nomos because it can be really either or. And uh, dated from circa date 400 to 380 slash 325 BC. What's really cool about this is you got Apollo on the obverse. And on the back, we have a baby not so baby looking Hercules fighting two snakes. And this has to do with the fact that Hercules was born out of wedlock. Uh, Zeus had relations with a human and Hera, his wife did not like that too much, sent a couple snakes to go and kill Hercules in his crib. And lo and behold, the demigod beat them both up and killed both snakes. So, uh, not something so we to hear, be trifled with. Yeah. Well, so here we have a not look, not so looking uh, baby fighting um, fighting two snakes. So uh, uh, and looks, wrangling, looking more manlike. I, I mean, this this is not a baby fighting them. This is a baby winning. It's definitely a baby <laughs> winning for yeah. sure. But uh, you know, other than his bald head. Uh, I'd say he's probably very far from being a boy. I mean, yeah, baby. it doesn't look like any infant I've ever seen. No, no. But uh, very cool myth um, and uh, very interesting. You, you know, Apollo is obviously uh, typically, um, you know, idolized on most a lot of coins in the Greek period. And so uh, if you're going to do that, you might as well have Hercules to go along with him. Absolutely. So nice coin. It's uh, pedigreed as well, which is always a nice thing, all the way back to 1910 uh, with Jacob Hirsch. Uh, it's worn, but it's a pleasant worn coin. And um, and so uh, they have it estimated 
fairly reasonable at 4,500 euros. I would expect it to bring eight to 12,000 or more. And so I, it may even bring 15, hard to say. Looks like but, a very um, well-preserved coin. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. And you're right. Um, it's a it very pleasing that. design and, and has a, mm-hmm. a nice, pleasing wear to it. It does. And I, my guess is in person, it looks a little gray in the photo, but my guess is it's a little bit more poppy, if that's a word. <laughs> no, I think I know what you mean. I think that this may be grayscaled a little bit too much. It might be. It, yeah. it really doesn't have any color to it. Right. That's where the videos really, I think, uh, um, you know, really pan out to be able to catch in really what some of these coins and you know this coin starting to look more black and white because they took all the saturation down and so um it, it could have color it, you know it probably it, does it may have color yeah yeah and so um you know I, a lot of times silver is very difficult and when you have a coin that's worn like this uh the high points will get real shiny mm-hmm. and you can see where they tempered those down and probably in photoshop but then they really took the saturation down. So, you know, this is the type of coin where it probably looks better in person. Yeah, it, it is probably one that when you look at it in hand, you'll understand why mm-hmm. the price. Yeah, but, you know, in Greek coins, what you want is you want artistic quality, you want centering, you want myth, you want uh, pedigree if you can get it. Um, and this is a scarce coin on top of it all. Yeah, and, and this so, planche, uh, it's in good shape. There's just a little split to it little split up there and so um, but it's not the end of the might world be in, might be interesting to see what the um edge looks like on that if that's damage or if that's actually a split because hmm. it, it 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 looks almost like a little bit of damage possibly but it's hard to tell okay so so anyway so that's that lot uh and uh moving on um there's a really interesting, uh, Mike, if you want to bring up lot 241. Gotcha. In the Jockey Air Sale. And uh, this is a obviously a famous coin. We've talked about Cleopatra and Mark Anthony before. And this is a denarius. The tetradrams bring the huge money. Uh, the denarii tend to bring a lot less. I think the last one we sold for about five or $6,000. They can go anywhere from eight to 12,000, sometimes can reach 20, 25,000. I've seen them reach sometimes higher. This is pretty high estimate. I assume they did that because of the very long uh, pedigree that it has going all the way back to 1926. And, um, but what's really interesting about this coin is I heard a story when I was at the a and Mike. Yeah, tell me a story. I love stories. Stories are fun. So yes. everybody like, come close and let me tell you this wonderful story. I have a nice bedtime story for you all, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast. So in any case, um, the story is I had a collector that came up to my dad and I at the coin show and we were having a long conversation with him. And he had talked about a Cleopatra and Mark Anthony that he had bought at a French auction and uh, it had a long pedigree and he paid something like 25 to 40,000 euros. I don't remember exactly. It was a lot of money, whatever it was. A lot for him. And uh, he got the coin and he decided to submit it to NGC. And uh, it came back as fake. And hard to believe. Sometimes we put on our blinders when we get these long pedigrees. I would say in, you know, and don't everybody get freaked out. This is, this is, this is not a scary bedtime story because in general, I would say 99.9% of the time, pedigreed coins like this are perfectly authentic. Um, and so, but every once in a while, one comes up that has long pedigree. And that's where the danger comes in of having coins returned. And then they go back to the owner and then return to the next guy. And then somebody says, oh, I don't believe them. And they say, it's got a pedigree. And it gets resubmitted to, to another dealer. And here it shows up in another auction house. So the client had returned it. And three years later, four years later, it ends up in the jockey air sale. And uh, maybe they're doing their dil- due diligence on it. Uh, the client said he reached out and they haven't pulled it yet. Um, but I thought that I would discuss it here because uh, this is here forever. Yes. Until we take it down. Yes. And so the reason it's fake, now it does look a little strange, um, especially the Cleopatra side. It doesn't look typical die type that we would see in a Cleopatra coin. And Mike, if you go to 
the first slide of our presentation? It. Yep. Okay. So um, this is actually a forger's die, and the uh, the forger was named Tardani, and Tardani uh, started making bakes between 1890 all the way up until World War One. He was making Italian Renaissance fakes, but then he got into Republican and Imperatorial. And so he did a lot of Mark Anthony's and things like that. And his his fakes are actually collected as fakes, not as real coins. Um, and if you go to the second slide. Well, Mike, just for reference. So this yeah. image shows the die on the left. And then they flip the image so that you can see the what the coin would look like way better. Right. So if you go to the next slide. Okay, and you'll see the coin side by side. You can see it's an exact die match. And so there's no doubt that this is a Tardani fake. And it came out around the time a lot of these early dealers obviously were, um, you know, didn't realize that it was a fake. And they all listed it and it kept getting repeated and resold and nobody did their due diligence. Um, so, uh, but luckily, you know, NGC is very good at detecting fakes. I don't necessarily agree with the grading and the stars. That's my biggest problem with NGC, but as far as detecting fakes, they can be good. Um, and so, uh, they, I got this, um, the, so these dies, these are actually original dies, Tardani forger dies that are in the Smithsonian. They were donated, uh, by Frank Kovacs, who's a California dealer, who's pretty much retired now. And um, NGC went and they to uh, to the Smithsonian. They and they took photos of all of their fake dies and die casts that they had, so they could have a better idea. And, you know, we as dealers we detect fakes when they come up, but you know NGC they have to study fakes constantly, and that's their job is to detect, try to detect fakes. Well, there's constantly new out. fakes coming out and new forgeries on the market, but... Well, you know, and here's, there's old forgeries, people like this, that people forget about. Yeah, but here's here's my only issue with NGC in this whole process, is the fact that NGC is, quote, certifying the coin, but they won't authenticate the coin. They'll, they'll technically authenticate it, but they won't stand behind it with any kind of guarantee, so... To that end, I don't really think of that as authentication. If there are no consequences for them being wrong. Right. You know? Yeah, they don't. Well, that's always been my complaint. There's no skin in the game. Maybe I am listening to you. And, and, and it, you know, and that's the other thing is that when somebody overpays for a star, it's good for NGC. It's not good for the collector. It's only good if the market continues to elevate to those levels. If they don't, then it's a problem. And if only a percentage of the coins, which are slabbed, I mean, people all the time, you know, they say to me, oh, I want to buy, like I got a call from a dealer the other day. He said, I have a client who wants to buy a Severin Dynasty, uh, which is basically Septimius Severus, Caracalla, El Gabalis, and Gaeta. And they, he claimed that his client said it was from the Coliseum work. Well, that was just a telemarketer that had paid to have a bunch of Severin Dynasty coins slabbed with that label. There's no Coliseum hoard. And even if there was, it's just a gimmick. And so I told him, like, buy a Ross of Timia Severus. Don't buy this gimmicky uh, Coliseum hoard thing because that's all it is, is a gimmick to get more money. And so... Uh, it, you know, and, and that's the thing is that there are a lot of telemarketers still out there that are producing coins for slabs uh, to essentially, uh, you know, take advantage of ignorance of collectors. Yeah. So, you know, so in any case, uh, so um, I don't blame, um, you know, Jockey Air for having fake in their sale. It happens to everybody. Um, sometimes you have the blinders on when it comes to this kind of stuff, but now when you see it, it's pretty much, you know, easy to tell that this is actually a Tardani fake. And the fear is, is that then this will either get sold or it'll get removed. 
returned again, and then in five years or less, it'll show up again in auction, and somebody else is going to have to notice it again. And so that's the problem. That's why I like we at Burke like to get the coins, put them in our black drawers, and leave them there forever. That way, they don't come back up for, up for auction over and over and over again. Yeah. So, any case, um, it's the right thing to do. Uh, Retire. <clears throat> it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. So, uh, moving on, let's talk about the Roma sale. The Roma sale. It's a great sale. Uh, Roma has, um, it's going to be end of September, September 22nd and 23rd. It's usually in conjunction with Coinex, which is a coin show in, in London. They have a two day sale. It's 1,437 lots. I just got the catalog recently. It's a phone book. It's huge. And, uh, there's some, uh, you know, some great coins like as, as, as a fall spring Roma auction would have a couple coins that I wanted to highlight is the first one is lot 87. And this is one of the 100 greatest ancient coins. It is a Carthage Cyclopunic Tetradram. And it's easy uh, for you to say. <laughs> and um, on the obverse, we have Dido, uh, who, uh, you know, it, some people call either Elisa or Dido, but this is known as a Dido. Dido was one of the um, originators of the um of the of the punic empire and so um and so she is uh represented on the averse in the coin on the reverse you have a lion which represents fertility power and you have the palm tree which represents phoenicia the old the old ways you know so it's kind of bringing in old um old uh, historical um iconography and then under that in the under the exergial line, you actually have a uh, Punic writing, which says either people of the camp, or some people will say it's the army, uh, people of the army. So basically, it's just talking about the army and uh, kind of tooting their horn at that. Now, from um, a complete novice's point of view, I have to tell you that I love this coin because of all of what's going on, you know, with the, the lion is really well detailed. The mane is, you know, is, is cool. The, the palm tree really recognizable. Um, something that I recognize from us numismatist, you know, or numismatics is, is the cap, you know, Liberty cap, yeah. Phrygian cap, uh, which Phrygian symbolizes cap, free, yeah. freedom of thought. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. to me, it's like, this is just really cool. It's, it's got, it's got something to it. It's it's both sides are attractive and it's just a really nice coin. Yeah, I think the estimate's a little strong at forty five thousand pounds. Honestly, uh, there's much better ones out there. Uh, if you look in the hundred greatest, you'll see a much better one example in the book. I would say this one's a little lesser quality than um, and the die work isn't even though the die work is very nice as you state. There are better ones out there, uh, better die die work out there, and so. <clears throat> it's and it's also worn um so you know typically these used to sell for twenty five thousand dollars uh is it worth forty five thousand these days yeah probably at its height so um it, it's possible uh and so but i think that's kind of the top i wouldn't expect this to go for 60 grand or 70 grand it could but it shouldn't yeah. however yeah i mean we've seen, that you can get. we've seen people lose their minds on much much worse coins 100% for sure. Uh, so then moving on, let's talk about the famous Labienus. And so uh, Labienus, interesting guy. He was never an emperor. He was uh, governor of Gaul under Julius Caesar. He was actually raised, uh, came up through the ranks of Pompey. And, um, and then he, under Julius Caesar, he kind of uh, was a governor of Gaul. And he kind of ran the gaul region while well, julius caesar or any time julius caesar would leave gaul and go to uh, rome and so he kind of had free game there and um and after julius caesar was assassinated uh you know labianus kind of ran over to the parthians and joined forces with them with his army to, in hope of taking over some territory and kind of uh you know help support pompey and then pompey was killed and um and uh you know labianus you know you can call him uh 
brave or or but I think he was more of an opportunistic person and um, uh, obviously he ran Calvary and so you have a horse on the reverse and uh, extremely rare guy and um, eventually uh, he was caught put to death uh, as a lot of these guys end up uh, well, with their result. I mean a lot of them deserved it but okay so explain this to me because here you know I'm looking at the legend on the obverse of the coin and mm-hmm. I see Labienus uh, mm-hmm. Parthicus Imperator, right? So mm-hmm. that would say that he was the emperor of the Parthians, right? Or Parthians, right? Because he he was he he actually conquered that area with the Parthians. But I thought you said that he was that Pompey was was the. No, he came up through the ranks of Pompey. I got and you. And there I'm was sorry. a civil war after Caesar died between Pompey and his supporters and uh, and Mark Anthony and Augustus. And eventually Mark Anthony and Augustus won everything. Yeah. Augustus won everything. And, uh, yeah, and, and everybody and, else died. And Augustus, you know, eventually got Lapianus's head on a stake. Yes. And so, uh, you know, um, in, you know, 40,000, I think is, is probably fair for the coin. Um, it's, uh, that's about what I think it's worth. These in high grade can go as high as $75,000. It, uh, it, it has a pedigree, uh, which is nice. And so that's always good because there has been fakes of these on the market. And so um, uh, there's a gold one as well. And uh, I think the gold one actually broke a record for Lapianus. Same dice? Not, uh, it's usually the same guys. It's okay. typical because when you're, you know, he was basically striking these in war to pay a soldier. Right. And so they typically, the silver was more important than the gold. So okay. there's not a lot of gold and it's usually with the same guys, just like, uh, when Brutus was, uh, issuing the Ides of March, right. The same Ides. idea. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but a great coin that doesn't, uh, always come up and it's a guy most people haven't heard of. And so, uh, I thought, uh, definitely a guy we should all, you know, pay close attention to. Sure. Great name. Lobby in is. Yeah. Great great name so and then uh finally lot 1077 we're talking about maximinus uh and so um <clears throat> let me pull him up here so or maximian sorry maximian so maximian actually he actually reigned with diocletian it's one of those shared um scenarios again that we have and it was actually during a time when everybody was kind of fighting each other and there was um you know a lot going on and a lot of power struggles going on um and maximian was actually uh his nickname was hercules and so he kind of looks like hercules with the beard and all and so why not have yourself look like hercules on the obverse of the coin so here you have maximian wearing the uh nemean line that hercules defeated in the first labor of 12 and uh on the sec on the reverse you have of course you hercules. Have hercules fighting the hydrea in the second labor so you have the first and second labors here represented on a coin that's issued by a guy that was very much militarily um strong and uh what he was known best for and um uh and he, um, you know, a, as everything, uh, you know, as, as rebellion started to take over and, uh, and, you know, he started uh, fighting against his son, Magnetius. And eventually when Constantine kind of, Constantine the Great kind of came to power, um, everybody kind of solidified and eventually um, Constantine captured uh, um, Maximian and, you uh, and had him kill himself. And so he actually uh, um, committed, you know, suicide. Allegedly. 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 Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, the detail uh-huh. on this coin is just amazing. And, it is. you know, if you're going to depict yourself, you know, it's like there's there's laureate heads that have their laurel mm-hmm. wreaths. And, you know, this one, if you're going to uh, project yourself to be strong, why not as Hercules? Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I think 25,000 is actually fair for the coin. I would expect it to bring probably close to 50. So, uh, so, you know, sometimes coins are overestimated and sometimes they're, 
they're right in line. So uh, this has a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, great aesthetics, and uh, I think it'll make somebody proud. It doesn't have a pedigree, which is, you know, kind of sad a little bit, but uh, maybe there's a pedigree out there. Who knows? Hard to say. Is there a pedigree out so there that's for the, every boy and girl? That's the, that's the Roma sale. Um, Is there a pedigree so, out there for uh, everybody? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, for every so, coin, at least. Uh, so let's uh, move on to our doofus purchase. Oh, okay. Uh, let me get you right back in there. We mm-hmm. will get to the doofus purchase. Uh, rolling, rolling, rolling. There we go. So this one drives me insane. I actually watched this go off at Heritage. And... Um, you know, they t- typically, if you looked at their platinum sale, and I brought this up in the last podcast, they typically go to the well with coins that they do really well with stars and on slabs. They do really well with Alexander the Great star coins. They do really well with Ptolemaic gold star coins and Ptolemaic gold in general. And they do very well with 12 Caesars gold stuff. And then, you know, a couple odds and ends. So, um, and Chrysos, they do very well with. And so you saw a lot of Chrysos coins in there. I tried to buy a couple of coins for a client and we had a price in mind based on what they should go for. And they went for a lot more. And so there's no reason to, as I told the client afterwards, there's no reason to be a doofus. <laughs> and he watches the show. And so he, he, he enjoyed that, uh. Yeah, he did not want to be a subject of our doofus purchase. And I knew that that was going to be the case, that they were going to probably be unattainable, but we, but you got to try unless you, um, you know, anything can happen in an auction. And so if you're not there to play, then you ain't going to win. So, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta pay to play as they say. Okay. So tell me about the symbolism on this coin. Is this uh, Athena? So, yeah, you have Athena on the obverse and you have a victory on the reverse. Um, and so the problem that I have with this coin is that it's not even an issue of Alexander the Great. This is an issue of Seleucus the First. Typically coins, you know, there are a lot of posthumous Alexanders that were obviously made for other people, but this doesn't even have the name. Um, this doesn't even necessarily fall under the Alexander title. And so typically when I get coins of Philip the third, who is Alexander's brother, or I get Seleucus the first gold staters, they sell for less in general. Um, but heritage generally gets anywhere from, I would say on average around 15 to 18,000 for Alexander. That's why they had a high estimate on it because of the star. And so, um, and maybe this one didn't even have a star, it just as five, 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 five. Maybe they didn't put the star in. I, I'm pretty sure it was star from what I remember. But um, thirty-eight thousand dollars all in is ridiculous, especially is, with an estimate is, of fifteen thousand. That's that's a ridiculous price for that. Uh, there's no reason, especially since not even. I mean, give me at least a lifetime Alexander or a Memphis Mint Alexander, where it really would even a Memphis Mint Alexander, which there was one in the sale, didn't bring this kind of money. So this to me was the biggest doofus on the planet. And there wasn't more, there was obviously more than one doofus here. So, because it takes, well, yes, because it, takes it always takes to two to run something up. But I mean, what this would show would be an experience on the part of more than one buyer because they mm-hmm. likely, mis, you know, mistakenly thought this coin was something that it wasn't. Well, they bought the, they bought it for the grade. That's all they bought it for. And, you know, and a lot of the Japanese uh, buyers, and Chinese, but I think it's mostly Japanese. Uh, they want only five, 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 five min state Alexander coins. And I actually had a dealer uh, that contacted me through one of the social media websites, and he asked me for Alexanders. And all I had was raw at the time. He said, "I only want five, 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 five min state. That's all that sells here." <laughs> And so, and they sell for stupid money, and that's why they want that. Well, and you can't fault him for for playing to his market, but at the same time, of course, you have to kind of scratch your head at the market. That's right. And so, why do you think Heritage stacks their sales with these types of points? Because people overpay for them, right? And so, um, all they really you know, want to do is generate, you know, revenue at the end of right. the day. And I would say even the Albert, the reverse of this coin has a dumpy dumpy uh, victory i mean she is like her face is bigger than proportionally to the rest of her body she's it's a nasty die the obverse is very nice i like the obverse die a lot but i think the reverse die is ugly i've seen far better and so you know 
uh, to almost like, I don't know if this is a record or not for an Alexander, but it, you know, I mean, look, there are die staters, which is the larger denomination that don't bring this kind of money sometimes. Well, so it looks like I don't the, understand how a stater can bring this kind of money. It, it looks to me like the obverse, you know, is so nice and they spent so much time on it. And then the, the reverse is more like an afterthought. You know, they were like, oh, yeah, I guess we got to finish this. Well, different die cutters, right? You know, I mean, there might be different die cutters going on. So, but vastly um, different it, skill, apparently. Yeah, well, that you know, the same thing happens on Greek bases. The master would do the obverse side, and the apprentices would do the reverses, and they were just pumped out um, in workshops. And so, the reverses of a lot of Greek bases are but ugly, and the obverses are great. And occasionally, a master will do both sides, but it's rare; it doesn't happen very often. So, generally. Um, if I'm showing a, a South Italian fourth century Greek vase, the obverse will be really fantastic. And the reverse is just two people conversing on the reverse, almost stick like it's not, it's not even close to even the obverse, even close. Sure. And so when you get one that's great on both sides, it's, it's very rare. So, um, <clears throat> and again, you got to remember, even in ancient times, these things were done in workshops. And so they were pumping them out. It was a business for them. And so, um, you know, the more they made, the more money they got. <laughs> so, you know, and they were exporting this stuff too. So, I mean, uh, I mean, coins were always exported, right? Because it's money. Money would never stay, you know, in one place. But even Greek bases were, were being shipped around. So, um, so in any case, I just, I just don't get this. I think um, I don't. I think that anybody who has a high grade Alexander is going to want to give it to heritage. And I don't blame them because uh, if you can get this kind of money out of Alexander's um, why not? So, but buy for our listeners, for our listeners, don't buy coins like this. <laughs> don't chase coins like this. If you really like the coin and you want to pay 15,000 great, but why would you pay almost $40,000 for a coin that you can get anywhere? Sound advice. So, in any case, there's my that's my that's my doofus. Okay, so uh, let's see. We got a little education there, and I think there's a little more education to be had. Yeah, let's get into that education. And uh, Mike, if you go to the third slide of our presentation, well, I can go there, but more importantly, let's take our listeners there. There we go. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. So what we have here is let's talk about myth, mythological monsters on coins. And why do I have my monster manual Dungeons and Dragons uh, book out here? Because you're well, a nerd. Because because I'm a nerd and I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons because I was a kid of the '80s, and that's what we did when we were kids. And so um, monsters have always been. Uh, something that has kept us up at night, uh, that has intrigued us, and you have made great movies about, and, uh, and so why not put them on the coins that has a lot of mythological um, meaning to the ancients as well. And so- You uh, think they were playing really Dungeons and Dragons? They, I think they were living Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> okay, you're probably right. <laughs> In their own minds anyway. Sure. So. Um, so anyway, if you go to the first slide, we'll just kind of run through these. Um, and, you know, obviously there's going to be coins that I'm going to show you here that are unattainable by most people, but it doesn't mean they can't, you can't find coins with mythological monsters in bronze or in low grade silver. And still, you know, I think it's a great thing to collect with kids if you want to get kids involved, because why? Just like my D and D days. People, kids like monsters. And well, so uh, I think that it's uh, it's definitely exciting for most. I didn't really even so, give this whole train of thought, you know, a, a thought before this. And I like it. I really, I think that this is an interesting way to go about building a collection. It's just monsters. That's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can just, you could do it with just gods, right? Yep. If you wanted to. And there's even a lot more coins with just gods. There's or no doubt about gods or, I mean, there's a bunch right. of different I mean, if you get you do. If you get into Roman provincial bronzes, there's all kinds of gods all over the place with those. Because you got to imagine, you know, in the Roman provinces, they were, these are all the, 
the the Greek provinces that were issuing coins under the Roman em emperors, and they each city had a god that they represented the city, and so they each would have their own take on mythology that on their coinage to represent their cities and so there's a huge amount of different gods and monsters and and i'm not even hitting all the monsters here it can go on forever and so i think it's it's a great thing to do with kids it's great for adults i think it's just a lot of fun and you can do it in all different price ranges now who's so on here the obverse have, of this coin uh so that's uh maximus or maximinus and then on the reverse of the aureus we have hercules again again fighting a centaur who's half man and half horse so i'll tell um, you moving what on to the next i'll tell you what the the emperor who was this maximinus maximinus has a monster of a nose on him he's that's a big you old. know um it, it's believed that uh increased size in nose and chin were actually a sign of power that was made up by somebody who had a big nose and a big chin and was in power well, there was a lot of inbreeding going on. So. Uh, yeah. So, but if you look at like Parthian coins and the size of their noses, it's, you know, it's, and, and some of the Cleopatra's. Yes, I, I noticed. Huge. I did notice huge. that. So I think it really, it has to do with, um, you know, I read once that it had to do with, uh, with power as well. So if you go to the next slide, Mike, we have a coin of Agricus. Uh, this is a very famous coin where you have Agricus uh, in Sicily that uh, would have the eagles in the hair, which is common. But on the reverse, we have a very unusual um, oceanic scene. We have a crab, which is common with at coins of Agricus. But then underneath, we have a skilla. And a skilla is half woman. She's got dogs in her forepart. And she's uh, kind of a sea creature as well. And the story behind her is that she would be close to the rocks and would and would destroy boats and the sound of probably uh, the water crawling around the shores and the rocks made a, a howling sound. So that's where the dogs come into play. And so, um, and so uh, this is a very famous coin today, probably would bring close to a million dollars. I would imagine. Now um, question range. is mm -hmm. uh, the obverse of the coin. Is that one creature or is that multiple Eagles? It's two eagles. Okay. Because I only see three feet. Well, probably one is tucked in or something uh, like just, that. Just curious. That's all. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it just was yeah. one of those things well, where I was wondering, I think, what kind of monster is that? Well, it's not really a monster. And I think it's more, in my opinion, it's more to show action okay. of the bird kind of picking it up and then taking off and flying away. So it's kind of almost like the same bird that's just kind of repeated in kind of an action type of thing of okay. pulling the hair. I guess that's, that's my feeling of what it is. So, uh, cause that's watching Eagles, be... watching Eagles swoop down and pick up stuff or is that's cool. Anyway. I mean, if you've ever seen it happen, it is cool for sure. For sure. So, um, anyway, very famous coin and, uh, a beautiful, beautiful monster on the reverse of the sucker. If so, say um, so. <laughs> moving on, we have the famous coins of Naxos. And Naxos was really um, into Dionysus. And we have a satyr on the reverse who is drinking out of a cantharos, which is a drinking cup, probably full of wine, since Dionysus was the god of party and wine and sex and all that fun stuff. And so you got horny satyrs, and you have uh, them getting drunk and wasted on their coins. And uh, this is a very famous coin, obviously one of the 100 greatest ancient coins as well. And uh, today, probably a half a million dollar coin or more. Wow. And uh, fantastic coin and one of the most sought after in the whole series. So um, this is just iconic Greek coinage at its best. And of course, if you go to the next coin, when you have drunken satyrs, sometimes they get a little frisky and they try to rape women or menads. And so here we have a satyr who's already uh, good to go and getting ready to attack a menad. Well, it's sometimes just what they have, do. That's what they do. Right. And so sometimes you'll have these on coins of Thesos uh, carrying off the menads with the satyr, with the satyr having them in their arms. And so, um, you know, women got a bad rap, right? So, um, they uh they had to deal with a lot and got uh 
everybody with their uh, always have with their package. They always have their all these creatures with their packages out ready to go. So, um, you know, poor them. But uh, but you know, Seder is very popular in, in Greek coinage, and uh, it's it's nice to see the different iconography. So there's one one more than one way to see a monster on it. What is that bulb up in between the two of them? Uh, that's just a symbol for the coinage. It's uh, it's nothing in particular. It's just uh, that's that, like, part of the die okay. that they created. So I'm sure it has some symbolism. I don't know. Well, that's kind of what I was wondering. I mean, it's, it looks like, you know, it could be mistletoe. Uh, it's, or... You know, a lot of times uh, the, the, they would actually, a lot of Greek coinage will have pellets, and it has to do with the mint maker and the die maker at the time. Mm. So it probably was an identifier for who's creating that die. Okay. And so typically they're just called pellets. Gotcha. Um, sometimes it can represent corn. Um, there's all kinds of things that it could represent, or grain. There are things that it could represent, but uh, in general, um, I think they're more uh, uh, just produced within the die maker's creativity, and maybe that's more of a, almost like a signature in a sense. Okay. So moving on, we have the famous Pegasus. And so, uh, of course, um, Athena and Pegasus go hand in hand here. This is on a Syracuse, um, a Syracuse stator, but uh, uh, you'll find a lot of Pegasus coins on the coinage of Corinth as and the surrounding cities of Corinth. And so um, uh, typically on the coins of Corinth and those city coins, you um, the Pegasus side is the obverse of the coin and the Athena side is on the reverse, but in Syracuse, sometimes we put it uh, with the obverse side of Athena first. But uh, everybody loves a little Pegasus. Yes, I, I have oh. never seen anybody who hasn't liked this coin. Exactly. And it, and it was even part of my D&D days. So Nerd. moving on, we have the famous Minotaur on the coins of Crete. And you have the Minotaur's Labyrinth on the reverse of the coin. And the story, we talked about this story not long ago where the Minotaur was uh, captured in the middle of the Labyrinth and maidens were thrown to the Minotaur to keep the city safe and eventually, uh, um, so that the Minotaur could feed and eventually the hero of the day came and killed the Minotaur. Well, you better do so, that before uh, you run out of maidens. <laughs> Well, you know, they produce maidens just for that reason. They're okay. Almost like feed. They're I, almost like th feed. That's a strange subculture. <laughs> so uh, moving on, we have Medusa or Gorgon. Um, and so uh, this is probably more Gorgon, less Medusa-like, even though sometimes you call it Medusa, sometimes you call it Gorgons. But uh, in any case, you have a figure with uh, snakes coming out of its head. And so and this is Antonius Pius. The, no, this is uh, one of the sovereign dynasty. I believe it's Caracal or El So Gals. why does so, the legend say Antonius Pius? Um, that was his titles. That was just the titles that he chose. And so this is just one of those weird ones in the Roman period where it doesn't match the emperor necessarily. So Timia Severus always has a, a long beard. And so eventually, Mike, you'll recognize these guys as friends. Sure. And so you don't even have to look at the legend after a while to know who they are. So Well, that's going to be helpful um, because the legend sure isn't helping me. No, it's not. It's not being my friend. So again, on the next coin, we have another coin of, of uh, uh, I think this is either Crete or Gortina. And uh, we have, uh, again, Hercules fighting the Hydrea and the whole idea of, we saw this earlier on coinage, but here it is in silver. And uh, the Hydrea, as you would knock its head off, more would grow in its place. And so very difficult to kill. But Hercules Hercules got her done. Yeah, it was up to the task. And then you have a bull on the back. Yeah, and you have a bull on the back. So on the next coin, we have the famous coin of Pentecopan, which is um, from basically the, um, the, uh, from the Balkan region. And um, there are a lot of the ones we profiled on this show are the side profile satyr heads. And, um, and on this one, it's a three quarter facing. And this actually broke the record for most expensive ancient coin ever to sell. 
back in 2014, I believe, when the Sheikh bought it for $3.2 million, which was a ridiculous price back then. Uh, but since then, the, actually, the gold eyed Maroma sold in 2020 brought $4.2 million. So that it broke the record for this coin. And this particular coin is going to be coming up for auction um, at NAC, I believe, this um, in the next month. This coin in general, and and coins like this. I mean, this coin is beautiful. I I really do like the the obverse and the and the the forward facing face, right? But I mm-hmm. will tell you that when you see both eyes, it's usually creepy. And this does not. This one does not take on that that uh, that characteristic. No, it's a rare. Now, it's a very rare. It's a very rare coin. And here we have two monsters because we have a griffin on the reverse, which is, um, uh, you know, half lion, half, you know, goat, half bird type of scenario. Yeah, it's, so, it's a winged lion. Is It has a goat. I think it's supposed to be, it's generally supposed to be an eagle, but here it doesn't look like that. Uh, it looks okay, like yeah, a eagle, and a, eagle and a lion. So, um, but here it, it doesn't look that way. So it's a little bit odd in that regard. And then you have a wheat ear um, below because they were probably exporting wheat at the time, that city. And so um, generally, you know, all these things are to represent the city. But I mean, the the artwork on the obverse of it is, it's just stunning. Well, that's why it broke the record. You know, when it first, you know, no one expected it to bring what it brought and the Sheikh got into bidding war with somebody and he overpaid. He apparently wanted it. it, You know, and I know NAC has already told the Sheikh's family that it probably won't bring as much, but who knows? I mean, well, weird you know, things have happened. That's what he wanted. He wanted it. He got it. Mm-hmm. That's not to say it's worth that. That's just to say he wanted it and he got it. It's hard to say. So um, on the next coin, we have the coins of Sikyong, uh, in, uh, issued in the, um, uh, in the uh, fifth century. And uh, here we have uh, a Chimera, which is very interesting monster he's half goat half lion and his tail is a snake so he's really got it going on and That's you can find fun. yeah you can find chimeras on bronze coins of uh Sikion, and they always usually have the dove represented as well on the reverse of the coins this is a beautiful coin he's used to bring you know anywhere from i would say two to four thousand now they've been bringing eight to twelve sometimes up to 18, 19,000 in really high grade. So they've been bringing strong money because of, I think, the strong monster um, aspect of these coins. Sure. Well, the the snake is a little obscure, right? You don't maybe yeah. necessarily see it because it's it's in the place where a tail would be. The the mm-hmm. goat is is there, but but kind of. But the lion is you know is powerful and it's it has motion to it, and it, you know it's like it is just a really really great. Uh, piece of art from that from that standpoint and the dove is fantastic it has beautiful you can see that nice rainbow toning within the yeah. laurel wreath there so it has a lot going on it's a it's a beautiful type uh i've been trying to buy one for a really good client uh client slash friend of mine for a long time and uh we've been having a hard time buying them because when the great ones come up they go for super money and okay I, so we just don't no go ahead i'm sorry we just don't feel like being doofuses Okay, so here's a question that I have from you, and this is this is going to be a contrast U.S. versus ancient thing, right? Mm-hmm. Because in U.S. coins, this type of toning is something that gets huge premiums, and mm-hmm. I would think that toning of this type would be more common with ancients, but I don't tend to see it. I also know that cleaning an ancient is not the sin that it is, you know, to a a, a modern coin. So that is probably the reason that a lot of them don't have that. But, I mean, A, does does this really enhance the value of this coin to have this Tony? And if it is something that enhances value, why don't we see it more often? Well, all silver coins tone over time, as you well know. And so uh, I think that it gives people a warm feeling to know that a coin's been toned because that means it's been out of the ground for a while. And so um, it's uh, people will, I think, go after a tone coin with nice rainbow toning more because of that reason. And uh, but in the end, you have still have to have nice artwork. You could have a tone coin with nice rainbow toning, but it'd be a crappy artwork. 
So in the end, it's just it's just one aspect of the of the coinage. Um, a lot of coins um, will get dark over time, like your silverware, and so uh, so then they're cleaned again to kind of bring them back to white, and you're going to lose that toning in the process. So one time, um, it was in one of our early Gemini days. I think it was Gemini two. Uh, we sold the Jacob Stein collection and Jacob was a very good client of my dad's from Cincinnati and Jacob had taken all of his Greek coinage and put them into on display at the Cincinnati Museum of Art and they put them in wood trays and the, you got to remember a lot of the toning that happens is because of the chemicals in the wood where they're stored uh, and so um, they tone with these amazing rainbow toning because they were there for about 10 years. And when we took them off display, it almost looked unnatural because the tone was so incredible. And people loved them because we could say, well, they were at Cincinnati Museum and they had these incredible toning and they were fantastic coins. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so that did bring those coins did bring a premium. But I think because a lot of coins are cleaned, um, you know, also, I believe that there's more toning rainbow toning out there more than you would than people see the knife experience photographs. well because you haven't necessarily looked at coins in person you're looking at coins online and so again you know if the photographer that are shooting these coins if they take down the saturation and make it more black and white to to alleviate some of the other issues they're going to lose that toning like I had our a first auction photograph yeah, I had big problems with my, yeah, exactly. I had big problems with my photographers early on because they were um, an old photographer because he he couldn't get silver right. And so he would take the saturation all the way down to black and white and it looked like garbage. And then you're taking RGB files, which is what your traditional camera shoots in. And you have to convert it to CMYK for print photography because that's what the printers uh, shoot in. And when you do that conversion, you're going to lose even more. And so um, some of those conversions are very difficult. If we could just do everything in RGB, it would be wonderful, but that's not the way printing works. And so um, when you add that, you know, there's three colors. You have red, green, and, um, uh, uh, and blue for most um, digital photos. And you have the extra fourth color in, with yellow in CMYK. And so um, it, uh, it does throw, and you have to have that stuff converted. And so sometimes the coins come out, if you take down the saturation and then you convert them CMYK, now you're gonna end up with a really dull looking coin and our catalogs look like garbage for a while. And so they're getting better, our photographers are doing a better job, but that was one of the reasons why I did videos because I wanted to not only capture luster, but I also wanted to capture that toning that we were starting to miss out on. And so, um, and also just what it looks like in hand. And so because of COVID now everybody's doing more of what I've been doing, but, um, but that was the reason why I started the videos because uh, for me, it was, um, you know, I have a big following on Facebook and I was doing, I do a lot of videos of coins on Facebook and people loved them. They called it coin porn. <laughs> so um, well, it, kind of is. And it is, it is. And so then I was like, I just, one day I said, this is what we're going to do for every single lot in our coin. I don't care if it's a hundred dollars. I want a video of every single lot in our sale. And my friends like, every lot? And I'm like, yeah, because I don't want the client who spends $100 to feel that they're any less than the client who spends $10,000. That a boy. And, and so, uh, and, you know, our company has always been service oriented, and I appreciate every client that buys from us. And so I didn't want anybody to feel like they weren't special. And so, yes, it takes a lot of time, but uh, it, 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 for me and what I want to put out as a company, it's extremely important. I have a, a, relatively different take on toning than a lot of people and mm -hmm. i appreciate it it's not really something i seek out i think mm -hmm. that that toning is nice when the coin starts out as nice right so i mean in in, in my experience i've had a mentor that was teaching me you know grading uh and, and basically what he always liked to say is that you know the reverse of a coin won't make the grade but it can hurt it. And it's like toning sure. won't make a coin, but it, it, it certainly, you know, it certainly can hurt it. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times my dad will, will clean coins that we get in because the toning has tarnished so much that it's turned dark mm -hmm. and you lose the features of the coin. 
And so when it gets to that point, you have to reverse it and bring it back to like cleaning your silverware. You have to bring mm -hmm. it back to white and then the process continues again. You know, so it's uh, people like toning because it just looks like the coin's been out of the ground a long time, which means it doesn't feel like it's been looted recently, which nobody <laughs> wants to buy looted material. Sure. So I think having toned coins um, uh, is 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 uh, is important, but it's not the end all be all like it is on a lot of U.S. coins. Correct. So if you go to the last one, we've got one more monster to, to cover here. And uh, we have My Cerberus, favorite. who is the uh, Hounds of Hell and uh, was one of Hades' uh, pets and guarded um, the gates of hell. And so uh, this is the nice point puppy. of Kizikis. We always know Kizikis because of the tunny fish um, at their feet. That's actually a tuna at their feet, or, or a tunny fish is what we call it. And, uh, and this is a really beautiful coin for the type that it is and the early coinage of Electrum that it came from. Yeah, this is cool. I I love the I love the puppies, and uh, and the incuse on the back is kind of cool too. Well, don't pet them. No, no, this is lose, yeah. That's you probably something. lose your you're probably going to lose your face. Look, but don't touch. So, so um, you know, and I, as always, uh, I want to thank uh, Mike Marks who wrote, writes for Coin Week. He did a nice article on mythological monsters on ancient coins that you should all check out and read as well as form ancient coins which does that. a whole uh submission of uh oh, it's in the last slide mike yeah last I, know, slide. I know i know uh... ah don't worry about it so anyway if you guys go to oh there you go you, i you got it, it. God. welcome back welcome thank you back. thank you thank you and so um you know uh, there are always some good articles out there i think that it's nice to actually go there and it's nice because it's a good way to Kind of make a check mark of the different types of monsters that you may want to get and so sometimes by following other people's works or articles you'll get an idea of the types of monsters you want to collect or the kind of type of coins you want to collect and so um so that's my that's my education section everybody likes a little monster in their life and why not why not so yeah this uh this uh forum ancient coins .com. Is a, is a really cool place with a lot of monster mm -hmm. coins on it. Well, it's uh, it's kind of like the uh, Web 2.0. It's uh, very much a group effort, and there's a lot of collectors on there that are constantly adding to it. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, when you have the, a community adding to works online, that's always a uh, positive. Yeah, I was going to say the page just goes on and on and on. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So, um, so, uh, Tonight I let Mike uh, deal with our pearl of wisdom, and uh, what do you, what do you got for us, Mike? Well, so yeah, yeah, you let me drive the car, and so who knows? I might wreck it, but I thought that uh, that a, a really good pearl of wisdom was a journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step. So sometimes I get a little overwhelmed with. Um, all the stuff there is to, to understand in ancient coins. And, and I just had to stop and kind of pause myself and say, look, you know, just keep taking it in and keep taking it in. Because what happens is over time, you start to recognize things and you start to recognize patterns and everything seems to start to fit together better. And the way I, I really started thinking about this was, you know, in terms of history, uh, when I took it in, in high school, I couldn't care less about it. And, you know, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. And now that I work in an industry where it's important, I'm starting to put the pieces together. Oh, that's that, that's that. And this is world history. So this is, you know, right. the, the ancient empires and, and really how the world developed. So it's, it's cool stuff. And, you know, you just keep trudging through it, keep hanging in there and eventually it will come to you. Right. Yeah. My favorite is, and this is when, you know, you've made it is we have a junk bowl, what we call it junk bowl, which is just, you know, coins that we put out of shows of coins that are probably only worth 20 to $40 a piece. Some are worth less, some are worth more. Um, sometimes we spike it with better coins mm -hmm. and, uh, but in general, it's a great way for people to start collecting. If the kit, we put them out of shows for people to pick at 20 bucks a piece in general, you, sometimes you can pick for five for a hundred. And so 
Um, my favorite is when somebody comes up and says, they pull one out and they said, who's this? And you can, and you tell them who it is. And they pull out another one, who's this? And you're going from Greek and Roman and Byzantine. And they're like, how do you know all this? And, uh, and I'm like, well, they become widgets after a while. And you just you learn to, you learn the echonography and you learn the city. So that's going to be like, remember always the history and everything else, but you remember what the coins were. So that's going to be like my final exam is you're going to, you're going to start putting up pictures going, okay, Mike, who's this? Who's this? Who's this? You know, my, you know, my dad said to me, um, he said eventually, and I brought this up earlier in the show. I said, eventually, you know, the Roman empire, the Roman emperors become your, you know, they become friends that, you know, and so you, you can just look at the imagery and you know who it is. Yeah. And, uh, and I've talked about the fact that when people bring Roman sculpture to numismatists, they do it because they want to say, you know, do you guys know who this might be? And then we have to look at it from the side and say, oh, yeah, that's Hadrian. Yeah, yeah turn it on his side. And then it's like, oh, okay, I know who that is. That's funny. But, right. but uh, obviously makes a lot of sense. I mean, we had a we had a uh, an amazing marble statue maybe 15 years ago, and the nose was knocked off. And my dad put the nose back on, turned it sideways, and it was Caracalla, and uh, and and it ended up um, getting sold to the um, Houston Museum of Art. Uh, we didn't sell it at dealer bar from us, and then placed it with the Houston Museum of Art. But it was, and we did the same thing with a bust of Hadrian. Uh, my dad put the nose back on, and boom. Oh, that's Hadrian. Now all of a sudden you know who it is. Mm -hmm. Got it. You could probably so, figure out who Venus de Milo was if you guys had the pieces. Anything's possible. Never know. So on that no. note, uh, we will wrap up episode 16 of the Ancient Coin Podcast. Um, you got anything else, to, anything else to leave us with? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to, I mentioned this on Facebook. Um, I wanted to bring up the fact that... Uh, Coin World have the most, the hundred most influential um, uh, numismatists, and my dad and I both. My dad made it uh, last time he did it, so this is the second time in most influential. But I made it this year, and uh, in the spread um, that Coin World just put out, they did a spread with my dad and I together. They used my interview, but um, we're photographed together as the. Um, top 100 um, numismatists, influential it numismatists. It is the top 100 most influential people in numismatics. Thank you. Yes. And uh, so it's a great honor, and uh, it, you're voted in. And so they actually literally had um, a vote sheet website, and you had to go in and vote. And so um, I didn't ask anybody to vote, and uh, and so it was a it was a it's a nice honor I, i'm very humbled by it and um you know the one thing and i was talking to um our staff mike and the rest of the staff downstairs today and i really believe this you know if it wasn't for my dad i wouldn't have the platform to have grown into the numismatist that i am and i will never forget that even though i probably taught myself a lot my dad's not he's okay teacher but he's not the best but you know i learned from osmosis and just being around it for so long and being around him but the business that he left me you know the business that he provided for me to be able to flourish in if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have that and so i will always credit him for my success and so and the business for my success and, and so, so the two um, of you will forever be linked which is also kind of cool and it has a legacy to it and that's mm -hmm. great. I can't do anything more than just say, you know, I don't know if this is what people think about it. That you know, I'm glad for you. Um, and thanks. Uh, appreciate and it. So thanks for everybody. It's well earned, and, and it is, I really appreciate it. It's well earned, and it is it is something that was voted by your peers, which is even more mm -hmm. important. So yeah, yeah. Well, and clients as well. So and um, you know, I feel like I have separated myself from my dad in some ways because. Um, you know, I, I'm also an expert in antiquities, which my dad knows a little bit about antiquities, but he bows down to me when it comes to antiquities. And now I feel like I'm, you know, getting very close or even at his level for ancient coins. And so, um, and so uh, it's, um, you know, I, there's things that I, we have different styles. And so that's our strengths as, uh, as business partners now is to, um, because we are different, different people. And so, uh, 
Um, the business, as far as the service parts that we did bring to the business has always been something that he instilled in me to be very service orientated. And so, uh, so, you know, I can take that as uh, something that, um, you know, I didn't have to learn on my own. That's something that was passed down to me. Yeah. So you took something that had a very solid foundation and improved upon it much like yeah. the podcast that we're producing now is, is, uh, improving mm -hmm. all the time, all the time. <laughs> So uh, we want to thank our production staff, uh, everybody who helps us put this together, everybody who inspires us. Uh, feel free to contact Aaron or myself. Uh, email address is right down here. And, uh, and, and thanks for tuning in. So uh, we will bring you another one in another couple of weeks, and uh, we'll learn more on the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke. We'll return with another episode soon. Meantime, you can join our private group on Facebook. Just go to Facebook.com and search the Groups tab for Ancient Coin Podcast Discussion Group and ask to join. There you can become part of our community where we share and discuss ancient coins as well as the show, the ancient coin market, auctions, or just to give our own opinions on things in order to learn together. Join Aaron and Mike again soon for the next episode of the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke.